Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, this is episode 34, and in this episode, we're trying to figure out why mushrooms have just recently been banned from certain restaurants and cafes across the UK. Is it something they did? And will banning them actually make a difference? We're also going to be looking at some new research that is trying to settle the debate between synthetic psilocybin and psilocybin extracted from whole mushrooms when used for both clinical trials and for psilocybin therapy. Can we finally say which one is better? So if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow, helps the show get out to more people, and helps them discover the wonderful world of fungi. And even better, if you want to see future episodes of the show, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. It's not that often that I am super surprised by mushroom headlines coming across my feed, but I saw one particular article come across my feed the other day, and well, let me know what you think. It says, Forbidden Fungi, Why Mushrooms Have Been Banned From National Trust Menus. It made me wonder, what could mushrooms possibly have done for them to be banned from certain menus? Everything that I've seen over the past few years, just more and more mushrooms being added to menus. Well, first I had to look up what the National Trust is, because as someone who doesn't live in the UK, I wasn't that familiar with it. And for the benefit of the rest of you out there that don't live in the UK either, the National Trust is a charity and membership organization for heritage conservation founded all the way back in 1895 to promote the permanent preservation for the benefit of the nation of lands and tenements of beauty or historic interest. They are one of the largest landowners in the United Kingdom and have lots of properties including more than 500 historic houses, castles, archaeological and industrial monuments, gardens, parks, and nature reserves. And within these properties they have about 300 different restaurants and cafes and apparently mushrooms are now being banished from all of the menus. Now what What's the reason for this? Well, apparently, according to reports of this news, mushroom cultivation could be bad for the planet. Now you might be thinking, wait, I thought mushrooms were a huge net benefit for the planet. For example, mushrooms can grow on all sorts of readily available materials, including agricultural waste. Mushrooms can help clean up the environment, filter waterways, and restore soil structures. The waste products of mushroom cultivation can often be recycled for other uses like livestock feed or simply as a rich compost. Mushrooms somehow be being bad for the environment doesn't seem to add up. So what is going on here? Well, it all seems to be centered around the use of peat moss for the cultivation of Agaricus bisporus, also known as the common button mushroom. So yes, that stuff that you often see in giant bags at your local garden center, that stuff plays an important role in Agaricus bisporus cultivation. But it's not for the substrate. These button mushrooms don't necessarily grow on peat moss. They don't use them for nutrition or anything like that because they're quite often grown on compost instead. The peat moss is used for what is known as the casing layer in mushroom cultivation. It's a thin layer of non-nutritious material that is laid over the compost layer to help retain moisture and help the mushrooms form primordia and eventually fruit. I have used peat moss, for example, as a casing layer to grow shaggy mane mushrooms, also known as Caprinus comatus, and it does work really well. It just kind of holds the moisture perfectly. You can buy, again, a big giant bag of this stuff at your local garden center for usually just a couple of bucks, and considering how big it is and how heavy it is and how much it must cost to ship, it's pretty amazing that you can get it so cheaply. The problem, according to some, is not the peat moss itself, but rather where this peat moss is sourced from, how it is harvested, whether or not the practice is sustainable, and what impact it might have on the planet's ability to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Peat moss is wild harvested from peatlands, the name given to the natural habitats where it grows, and these are ecologically significant and potentially sensitive areas. They act as biodiversity reservoirs and also play a a role in water purification. These peatlands can also act as carbon sinks, soaking up carbon from the atmosphere, which seems to be the main reason for the concern. Taking the peat moss out of these areas can be thought of as doing the opposite, basically releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And according to the Wildlife Trusts, this practice is responsible for up to 31 million tons of CO2 being released into the atmosphere since 1990, which would contribute significantly to climate change and to the loss of habitat for many species. To put this into perspective though, the harvesting of peat moss, and by association the cultivation of mushrooms, is not nearly the worst offender when it comes
comes to CO2 release. For example, the meat and dairy industry is estimated to produce 7.1 gigatons per year, or about 230 times more than the mushroom industry. Still, the sustainability of using peat moss for home gardening and for agriculture, including mushroom cultivation, has come under scrutiny. The UK has actually moved to ban the retail sale of peat moss entirely by 2027, giving a pass for mushroom cultivators until 2030 to try and figure out alternative solutions. Which, there are alternatives. Remember, peat moss is not used as a substrate, so the mushrooms don't depend on it for specific nutrition or to grow properly. It's just used for retaining moisture on top of the mushroom bed. So any kind of other material that could also help retain moisture might actually work. And on a small scale, lots of other stuff is used. For example, cocoa choir, which is like from the husk of coconuts, that works really well. Some people use vermiculite, which is also something that is pretty cheap and easily found in garden centers. Some people will use a combination of different materials all to provide a casing layer. But on a scale as large as commercial agaricus mushroom farming, finding a reasonable solution is a whole different bucket of mushrooms. One report on peat and alternative casing layers highlighted some of the difficulties of alternatives such as some of them have insufficient water holding capacity. Some of them have excessive soluble nutrients, which can also cause problems. Some of them are also much more conducive to harboring molds. And some of them have prohibitive costs. And finally, some of them just have an insufficient regional supply, making it difficult to source. Which is all part of the reasons why, according to one article on the topic, many think that banning the use of peat for mushrooms in the UK will only drive the production elsewhere, resulting in a loss of local jobs, and would be a hit to the industry without actually addressing the potential problem. So will the National Trust banning mushrooms from their menu actually have an immediate impact on the mushroom cultivation industry? Probably not, but it does have people talking. And actually, I didn't even realize this before doing some research for the story, but this is a debate that has been raging on in gardening circles for quite a while, with some people refusing to give up their peat moss ways and others looking for potential alternative solutions. Like anything else though, I think this all needs to be taken into context. For example, talking again about the difference between mushrooms and between something like meat and dairy when it comes to environmental impact. Because one of the things that we know is that mushrooms are actually becoming more and more popular as a potential meat replacement. So even if the production of mushrooms using peat results in the release of CO2, the net impact could potentially be a massive reduction. And there's no guarantee that any potential alternative casing layers would necessarily be better. Remember, this is focused on one specific type of mushroom, Agaricus bisporus. So think like button mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portobellos. But other gourmet mushrooms and functional mushrooms like oysters, shiitake, lion's mane, and so forth are primary decomposers saprotrophic mushrooms. So they are not grown on compost with a peat casing layer, but instead are grown often on hardwood without a casing layer. Still though, the fact that it's not all mushrooms, and that mushrooms can be used as a meat replacement, and so forth, potentially negating the carbon impact, doesn't necessarily change the fact that the peat moss is used and could be damaging sensitive habitats. Which is why, like so many other things today, this is a complex issue with no simple answer in an ever more connected world. To be honest, I wouldn't actually be that surprised if this deadline of phasing out peat moss in mushroom cultivation in the UK by 2030 doesn't actually happen. I wouldn't be surprised at all if it just keeps getting extended. Because these things are pretty hard to change. Maybe instead what is more likely is you might start to see peat moss being sourced from less sensitive areas, or maybe you might see some of these alternatives slowly being phased into the process over time. Nonetheless, this should be a pretty interesting story to follow. This episode of The Mushroom Show is brought to you by Fresh Cap Mushrooms, pure and powerful mushrooms to help you achieve your health goals. Choose from top functional mushrooms like the wildly popular lion's mane, also known as the brain mushroom, Room, the more classic Defender and Beta-Glucan powerhouse, Turkey Tail, or have it all with the Ultimate Mushroom Complex, which contains an equal blend of top functional mushrooms, including Lion's Mane, Turkey Tail, Cordyceps, Maitake, Chaga, and Reishi. Available in powder form that can easily be added to smoothies or your morning coffee, and also available in convenient capsules. So if you want to get mushroom powered, simply search for Fresh Cap on Amazon, or head over to freshcap.com to get yours. Let's get back to the show. On to our next segment, some interesting new developments in a very hot topic within mushrooms, specifically psilocybin mushrooms, which themselves have been a hot topic of clinical research for quite a while now. We talk about it all the time on the show. Psilocybin being studied for things like anxiety, for depression, for PTSD, and all sorts of other mental health disorders. It's really exciting stuff. But what you might not know is that many of these 
studies don't actually use mushrooms. Because instead of whole dried mushrooms, they use synthetic psilocybin, which is of course the active ingredient in these mushrooms. Well, technically it's the dephosphorylated version known as psilocin that's the active ingredient because our bodies will transform psilocybin into psilocin, but you can kind of think of it as the same thing. And it's not like synthetic psilocybin is totally impractical to make. It's not like anybody's whipping it up in a plastic tub in the corner of their closet or anything like that, but for well-equipped professional laboratories, it's something that can be done. And synthetic psilocybin is not new either. It was actually first synthesized in 1958 by Albert Hoffman, who is much more famous for being the first person to synthesize and experience lysergic acid diethylamide, more commonly known as LSD. Either way, the basic process of psilocybin synthesis involves starting with simpler chemical substances, and then through a series of reactions, like mixing and heating and cooling under control conditions, they're transformed into psilocybin. No mushrooms required. I always find it amazing that mushrooms just kind of do this naturally, I mean, they're producing all sorts of different crazy compounds. Psilocybin is just one of the ultra unique and interesting ones, but it's just amazing to think that mushrooms really are great chemists. The method developed by Hoffman to create synthetic psilocybin has been improved over time, with each iteration of the method becoming more reliable, more scalable, and more precise, resulting in a highly pure and consistent product. But even more recently, it was discovered that psilocybin can also be bioengineered by another fungus, yeast, which has been modified by scientists by inserting a specific gene from psilocybe cubensis mushrooms into the yeast DNA. You can kind of think of it like brewing beer, but instead of producing alcohol during the fermentation process, this genetically modified yeast will instead produce psilocybin. But no matter how advanced the techniques for creating synthetic psilocybin become, the question still remains. Whether or not the true clinical benefit is derived more from a single compound, psilocybin, or from the whole mushroom, which would contain a combination of compounds. This is referring to the so-called entourage effect, which could help explain some of the subjective experiences that people describe between different types of psilocybin mushrooms or different strains of mushrooms within the same species. But again, when it comes to clinical trials and therapeutic use, there are some clear-cut advantages to using synthetic psilocybin, mainly around consistency, dosing, and reduced variation among different strains and batches. But can synthetic psilocybin really offer the same benefits as the whole mushroom? Is the entourage effect real? Science is starting to dig into this question with some really interesting new research published in Nature that compared the two and their effects on mice. Reading from the paper, it says, psilocybin, a natural occurring tryptamine alkaloid prodrug is currently being investigated for the treatment of a range of psychiatric disorders. Preclinical reports suggest that the biological effects of psilocybin containing mushroom extract or full spectrum mushroom extract may differ from those of chemically synthesized psilocybin. In simple terms, this paper is asking if the entourage effect is real. Remember, the psilocybin is just one compound, whereas the psilocybin mushroom extract, extracted directly from whole dried mushrooms, also contains psilocin, nor psilocin, Biocystin, norbiocystin, and aeruginacin. They obviously couldn't just ask the mice how they felt during the experience, so instead they measured specific variables, such as the head twitch response, neuroplasticity related synaptic proteins, and frontal cortex metabolomic profile, which could have some analogous impacts on humans and how the different versions of psilocybin are applied. The paper specifically talks here about the importance of neuroplasticity, which they say is increasingly regarded as playing a key role in the beneficial effects of psychedelics on depression and other psychiatric disorders. So what were the results? Well, I'm not gonna lie, looking at some of the charts that they plotted, it is a little hard to interpret exactly what it means without a deep understanding of mouse neurochemistry. But according to the researchers, they found an effect of psilocybin mushroom extract on synaptic protein levels in four brain areas that is significantly more pronounced overall than the effect of psilocybin alone. Following up with the effect of psilocybin mushroom extract on metabolic parameters in the frontal cortex is clearly defined from that of psilocybin alone, suggesting a discernibly different or quantitatively stronger therapeutic mechanism. That is the key sentence for me reading this paper. The fact that psilocybin mushroom 
mushroom extract or whole mushroom extract could possibly have a quantitatively stronger therapeutic mechanism. They also dug into the concept of neuroplasticity in the study, which refers to the lifelong capacity of the brain to respond to experiences, learning in the environment, and to reorganize structure, function, and connections in response to such stimuli. They basically measure this by measuring synaptic protein levels, with higher levels indicating that the brain is more easily adapting to new information and new experiences. It is a marker of the brain's overall health and its ability to change, to learn, and to recover. This would be important in the effect mushrooms could have on treating mental health disorders. The researchers wrote, it is noteworthy that we found an overall increase in all four synaptic proteins examined over all four brain areas. And they found that the whole mushroom extract increased all four synaptic proteins while psilocybin alone increased only two of them. They further suggest that synaptic protein levels can possibly serve as markers for the effect of psychedelic compounds on synaptic plasticity, while noting that further studies would be required to understand the regional differences between the effect of the whole mushroom extract and the synthetic psilocybin on these synaptic proteins. The researchers conclude by saying, while our data do not provide conclusive evidence for the therapeutic superiority of naturally derived psychedelic mushroom extract over chemical psilocybin, they open the door to serious consideration of the potential of combinations of molecules found in psychedelic mushrooms, and that such combinations may not only have enhanced or more prolonged therapeutic effects, but may result in even more effective combinations by increasing the amount of the additional neuroactive compounds that are only present in extremely small amounts naturally. So does this answer the question entirely? Can we just say case closed that whole mushroom extract is better than synthetic psilocybin? Well, not at all. Not yet, anyways. And I fully expect that synthetic psilocybin will continue to be used used in many of these clinical trials. After all, some of the more recent and most impactful studies that have been done on psilocybin therapy did in fact use synthetic psilocybin. Would those results have been better if they had instead used whole mushroom extract? Although this paper suggests that that could be the case, it's really hard to know for sure. And again, there are some challenges to using whole mushrooms for this purpose, even psilocybin extracted from whole mushrooms, because there can be so much variability between the different strains, between different batches, and it just makes it difficult for clinical research or for therapeutic use. But there are some recent advances there as well. Another piece of news I saw recently shows that scientists have discovered a new way to quickly and accurately measure psilocybin from whole mushrooms. This is not just an issue with the therapeutic use of mushrooms, but could also be important with the eventual legalization and potential rollout of a recreational market. Since there can be lots of variability between different strains and people will likely want to know exactly what they're getting, well, you need a quick and accurate way to be able to test that. And luckily there's some work that is being done on this. A recent paper published by researchers at the University of Texas highlights a new way to measure the compounds in psilocybin containing mushrooms. They used what is known as liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry, a sophisticated, quick, and apparently quite accurate method for testing the levels of psilocybin. From a University of Texas Arlington press release, Kevin Chug, who is a professor of analytical chemistry, said, as medical professionals identify more safe and effective treatments using mushrooms, it will be important to ensure product safety, identify regulatory benchmarks, and determine appropriate dosing. Established and reliable analytical methods, like the one we describe, will be essential to these efforts to use mushrooms in clinical settings. I always find it so cool when people are working on stuff like this because the more we can learn about mushrooms, the better off we're all going to be and it's always really exciting to see and that's it for this episode of the mushroom show thank you so much for being here thank you so much for watching and again if you like mushrooms if you like the mushroom show please do go ahead and hit that like button it really helps the channel grow helps more people learn about mushrooms and if you want to see future episodes of the mushroom show make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode